be here now. Just be here now. Welcome to Dale Borglum's Healing at the Edge. We are very happy to share with you Dale's profound insight and open heart. Please go to BeHereNowNetwork.com slash Dale to support this podcast. Welcome, everybody. For those of you who were here last time, we talked about working with stress, and we talked about it primarily in a Buddhist way, applying what I'd call the Tantric Three-Step. And I quoted some statistics and some studies that the first one was that half of the people in America report they're so stressed out by the pandemic that they think they'll never get over it. And then there was another thing I quoted, which was a study with 30,000 people, and they had three groups of people they, they studied for stress. The first group had high stress and felt the stress was bad for them. The second group was had high stress and was taught that stress is not necessarily bad for you. Mindful stress. And the third group was just the control group that had high stress, low stress, just normal people. Not too surprisingly, the group with high stress that felt it was bad for them died 43% more than the other people. But the, the people with high stress that that didn't feel it was bad for them, did better than the control group. So it, it's not really stress that causes the problem, but it's our reaction to it. It's getting lost in reactivity and judgment. And today I would like to talk about some of those same ideas, but from a very different language, from a much more Hindu, tantric language. And I've been reading a book lately these days called The Recognition Sutras by a guy named Christopher Wallace, W-A-L-L-I-S. I'm not saying you should read it, but it, it, it's commentary on an ancient text. And if you do read it, my big hint is start on chapter 9, okay? <laughs> which might sound kind of weird, but that's where the good stuff begins. The rest is more dealing with things that happened a few thousand years ago, it seems. Today we're going to be talking more about a... Hindu tantric perspective on working with samskaras. Samskaras are impressions. Samskaras are what we collect when we don't fully experience what's going on in the moment, when we're resisting pleasure or pain. We create seeds, seeds of suffering for the future. Uh, so really what we're talking about here is stress and PTSD, but from a very ancient language. But there's a few things that were said a few thousand years ago that, for me, is a very useful and sort of awakening language that helps me stay in the present to my feelings. So if we're not fully present for painful sensations, experiences, we create some scars that when they're triggered, they lead to aversion. And when we're not fully present for pleasurable sensations, then that eventually leads to grasping. And when these things are triggered, then later on in life, we alternate between grasping and aversion, and we keep acting on the grasping and aversion. We end up lost in fear in the first case and addiction in the second case. What we're going to talk about today is a, a practice a very direct practice for not only dealing with things as they come up in the moment, but finding these samskaras, this energy that's pushed down this unfinished business, and being able to be with it, to access it, to dissolve it. But before we get to that, we have to do a little bit of foundation work. Basically, in Tantra, Tantra is really based largely on the body, being in the body, understanding that the body is the microcosm for the universe, that it's all energy. Everything we're experiencing is energy. Last night was the last of 10 days of Durga Puja. 
the Hindu celebration of the mother. In fact, we had a celebration downstairs where we were offering fire and water and flowers and incense to the mother. The ability to begin to see what we're experiencing as the mother in a, in a more devotional sense, I find is a great advantage, or for me at least, a great impulse to be with things that is a little bit stronger than some of the Buddhist things that I've been saying in the past about working with emotions. I'm not saying anybody should be a Hindu or that you have to really worship the Divine Mother, but to the extent that we begin to have more of a sense of awe and wonder about what it is we're experiencing, then it's easier to be with what we're experiencing. That having some sense that there's a sacred nature to things. And in fact, Buddhist Tantra talks about the same thing, that it's, it's all these, these deities manifesting moment to moment. We need to be centered. We need to be embodied to do these practices. Otherwise, we're going to be getting lost in the energy of the moment. Can we trust the support we're receiving each moment and being grounded, regardless of the content that's arising, and then can we move beyond that and be centered so that we can be using the energy that's moving through moment to moment rather than also getting lost in it? Centering will enable us then to digest the energy, to not get lost in the energy. The title of what we're talking about today is Digesting Energy, Devouring Life. Let me read a very short paragraph from this ancient tantric text called the Prachabhijana Hridaya. And here's what, here's what this gentleman, Samaraja, he says, However, when something has been internally deposited in this way, he's talking about creating a samskara, or even something that is actually being experienced now, when that becomes one with the fire of consciousness through the process of sudden digestion, also known as the method of total devouring, then it is said to be graced because it, because it has become integrated into the state of complete fullness. But today, what we're going to be talking about is how can we digest energy, both the energy that's arising moment to moment to moment, and when we're living moment to moment and we're uncovering, we're triggering some scars, we're triggering the unfinished energy that we've shoved down in there a long, long time ago, can we learn to also begin to dissolve that, to, to be with that? We often talk about letting go of things, letting go of emotions, letting go of the stuck, stuck energy. Energy, according to physics, according to life, cannot be destroyed. And the reason we're calling this process digesting is it's not that this unfinished business is we're getting rid of it, but we're digesting it, we're devouring it, we're becoming more enlivened and present and full of energy by being able to digest. When we digest food, we, we take it into our body and it gives us nourishment and makes us stronger. And that's, what we're, that's, that's why we're using this term uh, devouring or digesting. In the past, I have quoted a, a poem by Ram Prasad Sen, Ramakrishna's favorite poet, a Bengali poet of the 19th century. He was a devotee of Mother Kali, and he said, This time I shall devour thee utterly, Mother Kali. Thou must devour me first, or I shall eat thee up. One or the other it must be, but, O oh Mother, I shall eat thee up, I shall, install, I shall install thee in my heart, and make thee offerings with my mind. Ra, what uh, Ram Prasad is saying is that moment to moment he's going to be devouring the Mother. And in Hinduism, in Hindu Tantra, everything we experience is the Mother. Anything you can think, your body, anything that's solid, energy, matter, thought, it's, it's all the mother. The father, the male principle, is the unmanifest absolute. So in talking about devouring the mother, we're talking about moment to moment, can we 
be not lost in the story, not making up stories, not being reactive, but being on that leading edge, almost like surfing the present moment and being with the unfolding energy of each moment. And as we do this, at times it will trigger past some scars where fear might arise or grasping might arise. You were a child and somebody yelled at you and now you're an adult and somebody yells at you and you have this reaction that is basically you're reacting as this child, the samskara that was unfinished business from 50 years ago or however old you might happen to be is arising. And I'm not saying that we can fully be with that energy, but to the extent that we can at least be partially with it, we're digesting that energy, we're digesting that samskara. So we're always trying to access the underlying energy of the moment and digest it. Digesting sadness or anger will increase vitality and the ability to love. And as I said before, there's an attitude that makes this total devouring of energy much more possible. Uh, an attitude of amazement or wonder. Wow, my mind is really angry right now. You can cultivate being fascinated by your emotional reactions without believing or disbelieving them, but being curious about where it's coming from. And this notion of the mother and, and devotion uh, helps a lot in this particular case. If we can hold the energy gently, we get that it is just another form of pure consciousness by being present without identifying with it or making a story about it relaxing into it, embracing it. Since the samskar was deposited due to a lack of acceptance of reality, when the energy is fully accepted, the body releases the energy, and your whole being is subtly enhanced by it. So we're not letting go of the energy, but absorbing and digesting it. Energy cannot be destroyed. So all this stuff is kind of theoretical. I get it, but at the same time, Having this curiosity about just being with the energy of the moment, I find very awakening. It's instead of me just trying to be aware of my breath or even aware of my sensations, uh, seeing sensations as the manifestation of the mother, seeing sensations as this energy that's moving and that some of it is unfinished energy that got shoved down in there decades ago that's coming up. And as we digest it, we become full of this energy. We become nourished by digesting. We're devouring life moment to moment. So either the mother is, as Ram Prasad said in his poem, either the mother is devouring us. Life is devouring us. We're being devoured by life when we're being bothered by whatever this immediate circumstance might be. Are, are you bothered by the dreams you had last night? How many people were bothered by the fact the Giants lost game five and they really didn't de deserve to lose, you know? It was, it seemed really unfair. They had this magic so that people were very bothered. Anyway, it's kind of the point of that is getting lost in your feelings. It's a break from life, if you will. It's fine to take a break. It's time to turn on, it's fine to turn on Netflix. It's fine to get all upset about the Giants and hate the Dodgers or whatever. That's completely fine. The Dodgers completely deserve to be hated. There's no doubt about that. Okay. <laughs> How many people are in this group from Los Angeles, just by the way? Anybody? <laughs> okay. Always accessing the underlying energy of the situation. And what, what Tantra says is, once again, and what Tantra says has been proven by quantum mechanics mathematically, it's been proven, that there is not an objective, separable reality out there and that we are separate perceiving devices, each perceiving the same objective reality. It goes to the Zen question, if nobody's there to hear it, including sentient animals, and a tree falls in the forest, is there a sound? And the answer is no, there's not a sound because there's no consciousness that's receiving the sound. So the Tantra says, 
it's not this this objective reality out there that on the other hand there's one consciousness flowing through us energetically all these individual filters creating reality it's all energy it's all just consciousness flowing through which in no way diminishes the human suffering that people are going through i was i have a client that i talked to yesterday who has a very advanced ms so badly that she's feeling at times that her head or her arm is not even connected to her body energetically because there's so much pain and contraction. She's not sure she wants to stay alive. I could say to her, hey, it's all energy, but there is also the dimension of human suffering. We're, we're, not, we're, we're not denying that or pushing that aside. It's, it's both at the same time. But to the extent that we can be digesting the energy to the extent that we can be living in this tantric flow, we will be much more wise and calm and loving in dealing with the caughtness, uh, the concept, all that we see out there that is the result of, it, that uh, is creating human suffering in the world. The other thing I was really getting at this last week, I heard this other podcast by somebody, Liz Stanley, and she was talking about how, which is kind of obvious, but I never thought about it before, that stress and trauma are, are on the same continuum. They're on a continuum. And that, that stress isn't bad. We all have stress. But it turns into trauma when we don't feel that we have agency to work with the stress. So stress is not good or bad. Stress is a, uh, a component of life. And we need to create this, this sense of agency so that we can work with stress, which is exactly what we're talking about with devouring the energy, digesting the energy, gives us this agency. When we have this agency, then there's this window of effective integrative action to our tolerance for stress arousal. The wider the window, the more stress we can feel without going into trauma. And when we're in the trauma, our executive function and our ability to present are very much higher. Outside the window, we have a harder time functioning, and we have a harder time being with insecurity and ambiguity. So learning to digest energy allows us to be with ambiguity, insecurity, without turning it into anxiety. Can we, can we be with all the uncertainty of the world? Is there going to be another surge in the, in the pandemic? Could there be a new variant that can sneak around the edge of the vaccine? It could happen. We have no idea, really. Maybe it's all done. Maybe it's like the worst is yet to come. Nobody really knows. And that's just one of the most obvious examples. But there are more subtle examples of that moment to moment to moment. Can we be with stress, not turn it into trauma, have this agent, this window of having agency to work with the stress in our lives, devouring the mother, devouring our lives. And I just love that image of devouring my life. I, I've got all these images of Kali and Durga all around the house. In fact, there's Durga right there over my left shoulder, I guess it is. Well, they often have their mouth open because they're devouring impurity. They're devouring our attachment. So Ramdev, what you're saying though, what about, my problem is uh, everything seems to come together at me all at once so it's hard to differentiate or separate uh, there's a, a sense of overwhelmingness i would say that's my major major problem um with this do you, have, do you have any advice about how to maybe break it down slow it down would, would be better so that i could actually look at it because it, again it seems to come all tangled together all at once. 
So are you suggesting that there, at the same time there are a bunch of events that cause things to happen and then there's a break and then uh, the mother throws all this stuff at you in big clumps sort of thing? I just seem to experience, for me, for some reason, it seems to come, things come clumped together. Okay. Well, Rarely is, is it just one single thing. It's like at least two or three. Okay. Well, I, I, have two, I have two responses to this. One is, and I have always find great comfort myself when I remember this, that we can only experience one moment at a time. No matter how good or bad things are, it's coming one moment at a time. It, it, it may be the result of different uh, stimuli out there, but you're experiencing one thing at a time. So that can you be with the energy of that moment? Can you digest the moment, even though what you're feeling is the result of a financial thing and a medical thing and a family thing and a political thing? And all those things are going around together. And it only seems like a lot of different things if you get into the story about it. And your mind is jumping around from the political story to the family story to the financial story to the medical story to the financial story to the medical story, boom, boom, boom. It seems like a lot of things. But really, there's just one flow of energy going through you that you can be with. So that's the answer. And it's really, really hard to do until we talk about my other response, which is you need to be grounded and centered. When there's overwhelm, you're ungrounded. This egg-laying breath, this becoming grounded, is the most immediate antidote to feelings of shock, overwhelm, attack, fear. And the only problem with the practice of this egg-laying breath, the grounding breath, is it only works if you do it. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> you better mute me. <laughs> okay, well, well. I got it. I got it. <laughs> okay. And it's hard to do when you're on overwhelm to remember that you that there's a practice that can deal with that. Right? It's easy to do the grounding breath when I say, hey, let's all do the egg laying breath. But when there are four or five situations and the energy's out of control, then can you remember? So there's this wonderful story about the teacher Gurdjieff, who uh, he, uh, before he got enlightened, whether he did fully or not, I don't know. But anyway, he was this very rascally teacher from the Caucasus Mountains back in the 20th century, kind of a Sufi, kind of not a Sufi. He brought the Enneagram to the West in a certain way. And he would do things like he'd be with his students. Uh, he had a, a teaching school outside of Paris. And he would bring his students to a, a cafe in Paris. Jim might appreciate this little story. And he'd get them really, really drunk. And he'd say, I'm going to give you my, my, my best core teaching right now. And it's like this really noisy cafe and everybody's drunk. And he says, I'm only going to say it one time, and if you don't get it now, I am never <laughs> going to do it again, right? So that, that's the same kind of thing here, right? There's an overwhelm going on. You're drunk. It's noisy. You can hardly hear what he's saying. This is the thing that might save your life. <laughs> and that's the, the, so he was, he was cultivating. Here, you've got to be fully present for this. But the story I was going to bring up was he got to a point in his own practice earlier where he was, uh, he, he, he had developed powers where he could, just by using his mind, he could control things. If he, if he uh, wanted money, he just had to think about it in a certain way and it would come. Uh, he said he could kill an animal just using his mind at a distance of a mile away. I don't know why he'd want to do that, but he said he could do those things. He said, but in spite of having all this power, I couldn't remember myself, self-remember. That was his phrase for being fully present. So he tried all kinds of tricks. He got a mala, bees, and he tried saying a mantra. 
He even tied a string around his finger. He put signs up on the wall. And he said, nothing really worked until I came to the suggestion of what about if I gave up all those powers and I had to suffer like everybody else? Maybe the suffering itself could remind me. And he said, and it worked. <laughs> okay, so can the suffering itself remind you to be present? Or do we get lost in it and saying, oh my God, I've had bad dreams. Oh my God, my body hurts. Oh my God. And people, so, or on the other hand, we get attached to pleasurable things. We create the, these samskaras. We push this, we're only partly present for our lives. We're not fully alive. We're not passionately awake. And we become then addicted to things where it might bring us more pleasure and fearful of things that will bring us more pain. And we're bouncing back and forth between grasping and aversion, grasping and aversion. And we're barely present. I've had the experience a few times of coming out of a long meditation retreat and going right into public. One time, I was at a, a, a long Goenka retreat in America, Goenka style. Goenka never came to America, I don't think. But anyway, uh, it was set up so that the day after, I had to teach a workshop at Omega Institute in upstate New York. And my plane was late, so I missed the bus up the Hudson Valley, and I was stuck in the curb outside of uh, Kennedy Airport for about three hours in this like wide open state and just watching people. And it's like everybody was like completely frantic and like it seemed like nobody was there, right? And another time, the day after a Dzogchen retreat, I ended up at a 49ers playoff game <laughs> with a friend of mine. And uh, we ended up getting there early and went to the, the, the part of the parking lot where they had all the tailgating and people were barbecuing big pieces of cows and pigs and things and chugging big things of beer without any judgment, right? But that, it's like very few people are with the energy of their lives. When you're awake, even for chunks of time, not maybe all the time, but when one could be awake for a while, one sees the depth of a sleepness that is part of our society right now. And saying that with, with no judgment at all, it's like you don't judge a child for being young. You don't judge somebody who's spiritually immature for being young. But in seeing that, can that be the inspiration to be present, to wake up, devouring the mother, rather than having her devour you. Okay, hey, who are you? John. Yeah. Go oh, that, another John. Hi, John. Mm -hmm. I think my silence was just being overwhelmed by the the perception or the awareness that from a very young age on um i was taught to do just the opposite of what you're talking about in order to live i had to perceive the, and objectify what was happening to me and deal with it and try and manipulate it and um that um this process of undoing um is so well I just have to stay in the moment, I guess. And, and um, but there's so much to be undone <laughs> that um, there's so much training I've had that hasn't been devout about devouring my experience and integrating in, into my consciousness and seeing everything as the mother and all of, everything that you're talking about. Yeah. That was, that was part of what was stunning me after you stopped talking. Uh -huh. It is stunning, I guess, uh, to, to me at times too, certainly. And I'm not suggesting what I'm saying is easy to do. It's certainly simple, but there is so much momentum behind these, these samskaric patterns of working with energy that we have that just hearing the truth or hearing these ancient scriptures doesn't mean that 
uh, you're going to go off at a 45-degree angle to the way your life has been pointed. But to me, every time we hear these things, and it plants a seed, and it, it moves things just a little bit. Uh, and what, what I really got out of some of this reading and thinking and researching that I've been doing to put this talk together is that there is this quality of amazement and wonder and curiosity that we can have about things rather than feeling we're in some kind of battle, that it is all the mother, that it is all energy, that yes, we can think about it in psychological terms that, oh my God, my mother did that or my father didn't do that or whatever it is. And it's useful to do some of that work. I'm not trying to put any of the therapists in the room out of business, of course, but that eventually it's this more immediate moment-to-moment -moment thing rather than trying to understand what happened in your childhood to bring it to therapy uh, on Thursday afternoon or whatever it is, to radically surrender into this being with the energy of the moment, being with the sense of digesting what's coming up. And, and at times what's coming up is not the present, but it's this repressed material, these samskaric seeds that have been there for God knows how long. We're, we're pushed in there at times when we felt it was our basic survival at stake in order to uh, deal with that. We had to shove it down. We couldn't be there. We weren't mature enough energetically to deal with stuff. A lot of times we're dealing with parts of ourselves or parts of other people that are six months old or one year old or three years old or three days old and making the mistake that we think here's a mature adult human being when it's just a samskara that's revealing itself because it's being triggered by the current circumstance. When you meet somebody or when you are somebody who is awake in that way, it is a remarkable experience. When there's just, there, there's nobody there in the sense there's no story that like I'm having bad dreams or I am all upset about the, that the Giants lost yesterday. So that you, you feel the upset, but you don't turn it into I am upset about the Giants. You just feel the, the, the anger, the frustration. The, no emotions are good or bad. They're just energy. They're flowing through. And one can be a sports fan or one can be a, a lover of, a, of a, another human being or one can be a, a political junkie or whatever gets you going. And just let the energy keep flowing. Let it just have it be enlivening you. And certainly a lot of people use relationship or sports fandom or political uh, junkiness as an excuse to go to sleep. There's no doubt about that. But no emotion intrinsically is good or bad. Anger, fear, they're all messages that you can be with this. I'm trying to tell you something so you can be more awake. Anger's telling us to do something. You know, I don't like the way this is. I should do something about it. Sadness usually means to let go of something. And often when you can really be with an anger, angry feeling, it will reveal a sad feeling. I was first angry that the Giants lost. Then I'm sad about that they lost. Right? And so it, it kind of reveals layers of our, our emotional beingness. It's so much nicer to talk about the Giants than Donald Trump, isn't it? <laughs> okay. He was the example for t far too long when we were talking about emotions. What a relief. Uh, I can barely hear somebody. Is that Carly? It's, it's Annie. I'm, I'll try. I don't know what's wrong the, with me. Yeah, there you go. Now I can hear you. Okay. Um, jealousy, it was um, what came to mind when you were talking about being um, consumed. Uh, I had an experience as a young uh, woman and I felt completely consumed by jealousy, so much so that I, I w was crawling out of my skin. And recently I had another experience where I said, oh, I'm feeling jealous. 
this is a feeling I'm having. And I looked at it and I said, really, what? I, I tried to do what you're saying, consume the jealousy, saying the jealousy is uh, not founded in anything in reality. I, I don't know. Have you thought about jealousy at all with what you're talking about? Well, uh, what I'm saying applies to all emotions. I, I don't think there's necessarily a separate discussion about jealousy. Uh, I haven't thought a lot about jealousy because I'm not a particularly jealous person. I certainly have a lot of other tricky emotions <laughs> like anger and, and anyway, we don't have to list them all, but anyway, there they are. <laughs> if, if I listed them all, probably nobody would come back in two weeks. <laughs> Jealousy, as all these emotions are stories that we get lost in, I am jealous of you. And fundamentally, there isn't an eye in you. There's just energy, right? So that to the extent that we, we're getting lost in emotion, it's, it's getting lost in a story about energy. And there's all kinds of different stories. And you have a particular story that was a, a strong one back when you were younger that was just triggered by something in, in the present. And the response was not nearly as, as unconscious or strong as it was a long time ago. I have a question. Dale. <laughs> just a yeah. Hi. Um, it seems like what you're talking about really requires an awareness that's kind of detached. It's almost, and almost kind of an, an awareness of equanimity. I mean, awareness that's, I mean, there's a part of us that's, that's caught or, or experiencing this intensity but it seems like what you're talking about is also holding an awareness of a part that's watching us doing this and somehow ultimately having a choice of how we're going to respond. I mean, is, is that so? Yes. Yeah. But I, I'm, not, I'm not that fond of the word detached. Because that's how, to me, it implies something that's much more cool and distant mm -hmm. uh, rather than my experience that it's something much more engaged and connected and passionate. So that, once again, what we're talking about here today is a tantric way of, a, a tantric method for working with some scars from the past and emotions as they arise in the present. And Tantra, if we look at our healing paradigm, comes after three other stages of development. The first stage is motivation. You have to be really motivated to work with this stuff. The second stage is embodied mindfulness. You're grounded, you're centered, you're mindful. That might take a few decades of practice. Did for me, right? And then we talk about compassion and loving kindness and devotion, the heart qualities, that it's, it's very difficult to be with these. Uh, it's very difficult to, to do what I'm saying today without an open heart. And it's very difficult to have an open heart without embodied mindfulness. These are developmental stages. So it's exciting to understand Tantra. Like John was saying, he was... John uh, from the East Bay, and they're both Johns from the East Bay, John E. Uh, was saying he was overwhelmed by understanding this, how uh, all, all the being aware of how he's been conditioned. But there, there are tried and true practices to, to decondition. What I'm talking about is being embodied, being able to be mindful, being able to open your heart, uh, first in devotion and loving kindness, and then in the more difficult circumstance of compassion because there's suffering, and it's harder to open your heart to suffering than it is to God or to another human being because they're suffering. And certainly, 
whether you're using meditation or psychotherapy or body work or psychedelic drugs or your relationship, consciousness doesn't care how you get there. And there's, there's dozens of people in this room right now, and everybody has their own path. What's kind of tricky these days is that almost nobody has a teacher who's saying, now you should go to psychotherapy, and then now you should get divorced, and now you should become a vegetarian, and now it's time for Tantra. That We've got to pretty much hear the lessons, have this co-regulating relationship with our lives, and in this relationship make decisions about what practices to do next. And these decisions are often made by the ego structure that's trying to protect itself. Right? I mean, it's like, I mean, who's, who's choosing what to do next? Right? Is it the free part of you or is it the scared part of you? And it's both at times, right? So it, it's complicated. It's tricky. In this book, uh, this Christopher Wallace book, he talks about techniques of, of doing this. One of them uh, is uh, this digesting emotions that we're talking about. Another one is a, a tantric sense of mantra that you, I'm saying a mantra, but it's not me saying the mantra. That the the object of the mantra, let's say we're saying a, a name of God, so that the God and me and everything is the mantra. It's all the mantra. Uh, this great Saint Namdev uh, said, "Name permeates the universe densely." The name itself is form, and form itself is name. So the name permeates the universe densely. That's a very devotional, juicy relationship that you're, you're saying your mantra so deeply and so much that it permeates jealousy. It permeates giants losing when they should have probably won. It, you know, it, it permeates all that stuff. Another thing is catch hold of the first moment of perception without naming it, but resting in the feeling, the vibration of the arising perception. It's very difficult in a busy life without devotion, using the energy of devotion. Just, it's, to me, it's like surfing. It's, you're surfing the energy of the moment, and then again, again and again, there's a certain quality to the wave that grabs you and you make a story up about it. You're grasping at something or you have aversion to something. You fall off the surfboard into the ocean of samskaras and you got to climb back up on the board and paddle again, right? But can you just be with, just be on that ever-changing edge of a rising energy and noticing how at times that it gets so scary that you have to start thinking about stuff. Because you want there to, the ego wants there to be an I. Tantra is letting go of, of a sense of separateness. That what we invoke in the beginning is who we are. Tantra is letting go of identity. So this whole practice is letting go of identity. Right? Another way of doing this is open to grace in every moment by seeing no distinction between sacred and mundane. It's all the mother. And it's all totally mundane, chopping wood and carrying water. And the last practice that uh, we've talked about in the past is Guru Yoga, where you, you do a practice where you visualize this wholeness in an anthropomorphized form. Maybe it's Buddha, maybe it's the mother, maybe it's Maharaji, maybe it's Hanuman, maybe it's Christ, maybe it's whatever it is. And you visualize that being in front of you made out of pure consciousness, pure radiant golden light. And out of this being comes this light out of the heart of that being into you and it purifies you. And you're made out of that exact same substance. Your substance is exactly the same as the Buddha. And then gradually, gradually, the two of you merge into one. You are one with the Buddha. And you don't just do this as painting a pretty picture in your mind, but you, you feel what it's like to be sitting in front of the perfect embodiment of wisdom and compassion and love, which you are right now, always, 
And then you're purified by that relationship, which you are now and always, and you merge into one oneness with the Buddha, which is not something you're imagining. It's, it's reality. You are one with Hanuman. You are one with the mother. <laughs>